Welcome, everybody. Thank you for clicking on my lecture. My name is Paul Golden, and I teach Chinese history and philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, where I've been on the faculty since 1996. And this lecture is How Classical Chinese Works. It's a quick overview intended for non-specialists, but uh, I hope still interesting. So let me share my screen, and we will get started right away. how classical Chinese works. So very quickly, what is classical Chinese? Roughly speaking, the language of the first millennium BC, especially the second half, since we have uh, far fewer sources for the first half of that period. And it's not the same as what's sometimes called literary Chinese. The difference is that we believe classical Chinese was both written and spoken. We don't have records of the spoken language, so we can't be positive. But in later periods, there's very good evidence that the written language and the spoken language were quite different. Um, and uh, for those types of texts, we use the term literary Chinese to refer to a language that was really only ever written. Classical Chinese, uh, we think, was both written and spoken. And for that reason, it's presumably ancestral to all the modern Chinese dialects, Mandarin, Cantonese, Taiwanese, you name it. This is very murky because uh, most of these dialects um, were not written down until the 19th century. Some of them were written down a little bit earlier than that. It makes the dialectology a little bit difficult. And one of the characteristics of classical Chinese, as we'll see, is that it relies on syntax rather than morphology to indicate the functions of words. We can see that right away in our very first slide. The logic of Chinese, like that of English, is subject, verb, object dog bites person, subject, verb, object. If you were to write this backwards, person bites dog, it would not have the same meaning. If you wanted to place the object first, you would have to insert a particle um, to indicate the agency. So you would have to say person bitten by dog. So the form of the verb, notice whether it's uh, functioning in the active or the passive sense is the same. The word for bites is the same. We can tell who's biting whom by the syntax. The morphology gives us nothing. It's possible that in Proto-Chinese or in the language even older than Old Chinese, there were uh, morphological aspects that have since been lost. It's controversial and difficult for us to reconstruct. But when we have sentences like this in good classical Chinese, we can see that the morphology is essentially zero. What a word is doing in a sentence is to dependent on where it's placed in the sentence. That's about where the similarities with English end. So English is a subject verb object language too. Um, but we'll see right away that it gets a little bit more complicated. Complex Chinese sentences are composed not of subject and predicate, but of topic and comment. And this is true of um, um, modern Chinese as well. The comment like a uh, predicate in English, must have a verb, but crucially, the subject of the verb of the comment doesn't have to be the topic. The topic is necessarily a noun. It can be an abstract noun. It can be a concrete noun. It's the thing that we're talking about. Um, and then the comment is a comment about that topic. And this illustrative sentence, which is a real sentence, so dog bites person and person bites dog, I cooked that. That's not a real sentence uh, from, from a Chinese text. but um, every other example I'm going to give comes from a uh, you know, real classical Chinese source. So we have Yanzhibuzu, Hu Jie Tanzhi. Yanzhibuzu, the insufficiency of words. We'll come back to this zhi in a moment. It basically connects two nouns. So it tells you that insufficient has to be a noun. So we're talking about insufficiency. Uh, the insufficiency of words, that's the topic. Gu Jie Tanzhi. Thus, we moan and sigh then. The subject of moaning and sighing is we. It's not the insufficiency of words. Yandru Butsu is not the subject of Jetan. And in English, very often, you can't really capture what's going on in the Chinese sentence without adding some extra words. In this case, when. When words are insufficient, namely to express our feelings, we moan and sigh them. We moan and sigh our feelings. 
You don't need to indicate the when in Chinese because the topic comment structure tells you right away that we moan and sigh them is a comment on the topic of the insufficiency of words. English is really not like this at all. Another example, Shang Shang Wen, Wei Zhi Yin. Shang Shang Wen sounds attain a pattern, that's the topic. Wei Zhi Yin, we call it a tone. That's the comment, again, a new subject. This topic contains a verb, but none of the nouns in the topic function as the subject of the word Wei. We are the ones who call it a tone. And in this case, once again, a when clause in English helps us translate what's going on in much more lapidary fashion in classical Chinese. When sounds attain a pattern, we call this a tone. So there are all different kinds of sounds, crash, bam, boom, but only certain types of sounds uh, can be called tones. Those are the ones that are patterned uh, in some way that the text goes on to describe. So once again, you don't need a when in Chinese. You can just indicate this using the topic comment structure. One more example, a very famous sentence, Zhu Zhong He, Tian Di Wei Yan. Wei is a verb to attain one's place, but the subject is heaven and earth. Heaven and earth attain their place. It's not Zhu Zhong He, which means to bring about centrality and harmony. So Zhu Zhong He is the topic, once again, when helps us. When one brings about centrality and harmony, heaven and earth attain their place thereby. Uh, it's a remarkable philosophical statement. The people who are bringing about centrality and harmony are humans. We're doing this. We're helping heaven and earth attain their place. In most philosophies, the idea is that heaven and earth already have their place and we have to um, figure out how to fit in. This is saying that the relationship is a little more mutual. Our action of bringing about centrality and harmony helps heaven and earth attain their place. Here's another respect in which classical Chinese is very different from English. There are four basic parts of speech. This is my theory. I'm not sure you would find this in any textbook, but I think it works. This is how I've been teaching classical Chinese at Penn for over 25 years now. There are nouns, there are verbs, there are attributes, and there are grammatical particles. You don't need more than that. I'm a minimalist. Why postulate more parts of speech than you need? More than that, any word can function as any part of speech, depending on its position in the sentence. We'll see some examples of this. Attributes are always placed before the noun or verb that they modify, and that's why I don't distinguish between adjectives and adverbs. Syntactically, they look identical. They just go right in front of whatever they're modifying, whether it's a noun or a verb. The key to understanding any sentence is identifying the parts of speech. Here's an example. And what's different this time is that I'm indicating the parts of speech at the bottom. Zheng de shi, mo jing yu shi. The particle yu is always followed by a noun. Terrific aid. When we want to parse this, we're going to see some other examples of this at the uh, at the end. Particles that help us unlock a sentence because we know their grammatical function precisely. So since it is always followed by a noun, we know that sure must be a noun poetry. And that means the only possible word that can be the verb in the comment is Jin nothing is, uh, to be close to. This type of verb is sometimes called a state of verb to be close to. Um, in English, we don't really construct sentences like that. To be close to is a copula, X is close to Y. Um, you have a copula and then a predicative adjective, close. Uh, in Chinese, you don't need to do that. You don't need a copula. You don't need predicative adjectives, anything like that. You just have a verb to be close to. On the left, the very first word, Zheng is a verb, and it's followed by to ensure, which must be its objects. So you can see that there are different types of verbs. Zheng to rectify is very similar to what we call a transitive verb in English. It's a verb that requires an object to rectify gain and loss, to rectify success and failure, probably more idiomatically. And then it also has verbs that do not 
um, require an object, in this case, Jean, to be, to be close to, um, in this case, closer to hand, more convenient to rectify success and failure, nothing is closer to hand than poetry. Uh, the philosophy, underlying philosophy is that you can use poetry to uh, govern your society. Another example. 上六天使,下西水土. This refers to Confucius. You know that in context, just from the sentence, you don't know that. Above, he regarded the heavenly seasons as his law. Below, he conformed to water and earth. Lu is a so-called putative verb to regard as law. Um, it means law or statute, standard, something like that. Here, it's clearly a verb. And there are different kinds of verbs. We saw transitive verbs. We saw stative verbs. Now we have what's called a putative verb to regard something as law. And the object of what he regards as law is Tianshi, the heavenly seasons. Shang and Xia are attributes indicating the manner in which Confucius regarded heaven's seasons as his law and conformed to water and earth respectively. So the two verbs are to regard as law and to conform to. Above and below are attributes modifying those verbs. And then the heavenly season and water and earth are the objects of the verbs. Now, as I said, fortunately, there are some particles that aid in construing parts of speech. Otherwise, sentences might be um, either highly ambiguous or possibly unintelligible. The language does work because there are uh, particles that uh, will immediately signal certain parts of speech. And then from there, you can parse the rest of the sentence. So we saw above that you is always followed by a noun. A few other examples are connects to verbs. Zhi connects to nouns. There are other uses of zhi that we won't have time to look at. Bu negates a verb, fei negates a noun. There are many other useful particles that I won't be able to discuss in this short presentation, but these are some representative ones that give you a sense of how all is not lost. We can usually tell with reasonable confidence what part of speech each word is um, playing. So R connects two verbs. Here's a wonderful one. R is right in the middle. So you know you need to find a verb to the left and a verb to the right. But to the left, all you have is Junzi, nobleman, which is usually a noun, a nobleman, member of the hereditary aristocracy, or in this moralistic language, somebody who, believe, who behaves the way a, a nobleman should, regardless of birth. But it has to be a verb. It has to be a verb because R connects two verbs. In Chinese, you don't say wo ar ni, you know, like me, <laughs> you and I. Um, when there's an R, there's got to be a verb on the left and a verb on the right. So junza has to be a verb, in this case, to be a nobleman or to act as a nobleman. Then there has to be another verb after uh, R, and this is zhong to hold to the mean. So sure is an attribute because it comes before the verb in a timely fashion. He is a nobleman and thus holds to the mean at the right time. The only way you know this is because R is telling you you have to find a verb before it and you have to find a verb after it. If you took out that R and you just said Junzi Shizhong, then that Junzi would probably con be construed as a noun. The nobleman um, holds to the mean at the right time. Be the subject of Zhong. Throwing that R in between the two inevitably makes Junzi a verb. And so you can see, that although the language is very lapidary, doesn't require morphology and you can express a lot of meaning very tightly. It's part of the reason why classical Chinese poetry is so beautiful. It also permits translators 
quite a bit of leeway to try to find both accurate yet idiomatic and even elegant translations. There are a number of different ways in English that you could translate Junzo as a verb, to be a nobleman, to act as a nobleman, to act as befits a nobleman. Um, it's up to the translator to fill this out. And they're all defensible. Um, the only thing that's indefensible, we'll see this, uh, a clearer example of this in a moment. The only thing that would be indefensible would be to miss the verbal significance of Junza and just translate it as a noun, because that would be misconstruing the grammar of the whole sentence. Zhu connects two nouns. Mei sheng de zhi xing rong. So the phrase xing rong shape and appearance has to be a noun. We know this because it follows zhi. And so we also know that there has to be a noun before the zhi, and that is the virtue. So the shape and appearance of virtue, what kind of virtue? Flourishing virtue. The shape and appearance of flourishing virtue, and that whole thing is the object of the causative verb may to beautify. So we have transitive verbs, we have stative verbs, we have putative verbs. Now we have a type of verb that we conventionally call causative to make something such. May normally means beauty or beautiful. Here as a verb, it means to make something beautiful. So the whole phrase means to beautify. To beautify what? The shape and appearance of flourishing virtue. Zhi is often how we um, indicate the possessive in classical Chinese. But literally, the object of beautify is the pertaining to flourishing virtue, shape, and appearance. Of course, you can't say that in good idiomatic English. So normally, what we do in English is throw in an of in our translations, the shape and appearance of flourishing virtue. Who negates a verb? Fe negates a noun. Here we have Junzi again. Bu is telling you that the next word has to be a verb. So we have a similar issue as before. Qi normally is a noun, utensil, vessel, tool, implement. But here it has to be a verb. The famous saying is usually translated as the nobleman is not a utensil. But qi has to be a verb because it's negated by bu, not fei. Thus, the nobleman does not serve as a utensil, does not act as a utensil. Uh, philosophically, this is a very um, interesting statement. There's a lot of philosophical unpacking that you can do. And notice once again that the translator um, is given a lot of leeway. You have to find a verb for utensil, but it's up to you to decide what verb of utensil you think fits the sentence best. To act as a utensil, to serve as a utensil, to be a utensil. These would all be acceptable, but once again, the only mistake that would categorically be unacceptable, which you find in a lot of published translations incidentally, is the nobleman is not a utensil taking utensil strictly as a noun, because then it would not be Junzi Buqi, then it would be Junzi Fei Qi. And that's absolutely not what the text says. I've tried to convey just how much meaning comes out of these very tight Chinese sentences. They can be extremely beautiful. Um, they trick of good writing is to make an intelligible, meaningful sentence with as little extraneous, with as few extraneous syllables, let's put it that way, as possible. And in the hands of the best writers, this language can be um, very, very powerful and moving with lots and lots of sentences and phrases that are impossible to forget uh, once you hear them. And it means that translation is um, a bit of an art. So translating any language is an art because no two languages have exactly the same grammar, or exactly the same um, uh, worldview and so on. But in classical Chinese, you know, if you 
throw French or Spanish into Google Translate, you'll get an English translation that's pretty good. If you throw classical Chinese into Google Translate, it's hopeless because there is so much interpretation that's necessary. Is this a noun? Is this a verb? Oh, it's a verb. Well, what kind of a verb? To serve as a utensil, to be as a utensil, so, such and such. Maybe one day the Google al algorithms will be able to translate classical Chinese beautifully. But as you can see, it's a very different task from translating something like uh, French or Spanish or German uh, accurately because the grammar allows for so much interpretation. It's part of the reason also why the philosophy is so rich. Different people can interpret the same statement sincerely in um, fruitfully divergent ways. That's all we have time for. I hope I've whetted your appetite for classical Chinese grammar. Thank you very much.